no matter how hard I try. She just doesn't appreciate me. I still remember the first time I told David about my mom. At the time, I was in the fourth year of my PhD in neuroscience, and David and I had really connected. Dr. David Hubel was a Harvard Medical School professor who had won the Nobel Prize in medicine. Literally, one of the fathers of neuroscience. He discovered how the brain's visual system helps us see the world. And I was just a smart ass PhD student who liked to bitch about my mom. You know, David, my mom doesn't have a goddamn clue about what I do in the lab all day. One time, she asked me about my PhD thesis. And I told her that I'm trying to figure out how the brain perceives motion in the environment. I even showed her my publications. But she completely ignored me and goes, what is there to study? You just open up your eyes and see the motion. But my dad, thank God he's an anesthesiologist who went to medical school. At least he knows a little bit about my research. However, my mom, she's a typical uneducated fool. Dr. Hubel sensed my anger and tried to calm me down as usual. Farhan, let me teach you a few things that your mom's untrained mind cannot comprehend. You see, during our mentoring sessions, Dr. Hubel always gave me these gold big picture insights that he had learned at Harvard and Johns Hopkins. You see, son, the first mistake of an unscientific mind is that it stays on the surface. This type of brain wiring is incapable of digging deeper. The second problem is that lay people, the general public, think that correlation equals causation. And the most harmful error, the third big mistake, is that they cherry pick whatever fits their agenda and use anecdotes to make big claims because it makes things easier. And remember, Farhan, you will encounter a lot of people like that in science and medicine. Watch out for these dangerous people. They will generalize instead of looking at the nuances and trick people with their correlation results and use anecdotal evidence and cherry picking of scientific data to gain wealth and power. These are the most evil people in the world, especially when they have authority and credentials. And many of them know exactly what they're doing. Your mom, she's innocent. But there are men out there who will take advantage of this innocence. Dr. Hubel seemed very serious. And I think that he was trying to warn me against guys like this. And today, I'm gonna break down the real science behind Dr. Stephen Gundry's claims. Is he a sneaky salesman or a legit authority in nutrition, biochemistry, and gut health? Is there any scientific evidence backing up his statements or is he just another marketer trying to scare you and take your money? But before we get into the sexy science, why don't I let Dr. Gundry brag about himself? My name is Dr. Stephen Gundry, and you may know me from my 20 years as one of the top cardiothoracic surgeons in America. I perform more infant heart transplants than any other doctor in the world. And if you or a loved one has ever had open heart surgery, you were likely kept alive using medical devices I invented during my career. Wow, what a gangster this guy. But why did he get into nutrition and gut health after practicing as a surgeon? My career took a turn as I dedicated myself to learning and overcoming the skyrocketing issues of weight gain, digestive problems, and other serious issues experienced by over half of Americans. Ah, he made a sacrifice and quit his prestigious position at the hospital to help out his fellow Americans. So how exactly are you gonna do that, Gundry? I've since written seven best-selling books on health. I've spoken at major universities around the world, and my online videos on health and wellness have been watched by over 20 million people today. <laughs> wow, this guy has been chosen by God to deliver the ultimate gut health revelation to mankind. He's a goddamn prophet. Not a prophet. Uh, what? Well, if you're not a prophet, then how did you come up with these prophetic revelations? Take a look. Fruit to avoid number one, ripe bananas. 
half of a banana's calories come from sugar. Damn that sugar. Oh well, I guess I can't have my post-workout banana anymore. Fruit to avoid number two, grapes. Grapes are one of the highest sugar fruits on earth. They're basically tiny sugar bombs. As much as my people love bombs, I guess I gotta throw away the grapes. Fruit to avoid number three, mangoes. One mango has a whopping 46 grams of sugar. That's the same as three candy bars. Mangoes too? I love mangoes. But I guess it's okay. I can buy a bunch of Snickers candy bars. Hey, Dr. Gundry, will you please at least let me eat some apples? Cause you know, an apple a day keeps Dr. Gundry Whopper. away. You said grapes are sugar bombs that are they problematic. They are sugar bombs. There's as but much that sugar mean that... in a cup of grapes as in a Hershey's candy bar. Yeah, but that requires nuance. Wait. What? I can also have Hershey's candy bars? Did I hear that correctly? Grapes are a sugar bomb. Might as well give them Hershey's. They will give them Hershey's. <laughs> Might as well. Might as well. Bro, sign me up, dude. I will buy all your books and your programs and your supplements. Like, I'm in. But you didn't answer my question. Can I eat apples, please? On yeah. Lewis House podcast, oh, this is a I quote love from that. you. Yes. Apples are horrible for you. Yeah, they are. Oh. Okay, last question. Tomatoes are like a borderline vegetable, right? Can I at least eat those? They're loaded with lectins, particularly in the peel and the seeds. So unbeknownst to you, that healthy cherry tomato is a gut-busting bomb. Fair enough. Fair enough. What are lectins again? That's a lectin exactly. Short answer, it's a dangerous plant protein designed to poison you. All right, that's enough of Gundry's goofiness. It's science time, baby. Let's break this down one by one. First, we need to know what the science says about fruit consumption and should we actually worry about the sugar inside fruits? And is eating candy bars the same thing as eating fruits? And uh, what about Gundry's lectin nonsense? Is there any legitimacy to this? Grapes first. Turns out that grapes are full of phytochemicals and they're linked with a reduced risk of chronic diseases, including certain types of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Grapes have strong antioxidant activity. Huh. But bro, that's not the only study. Here are a few more and there's hundreds more, maybe thousands. And now let's see if bananas are healthy or has Gundry gone bananas. Banana contains several bioactive compounds such as phenolics, carotenoids, biogenic amines, and phytosterols, which are highly desirable in the diet and they exert many positive effects on human health and well-being. Many of those compounds have antioxidant activities and are effective in protecting the body against various oxidative stresses. In the past, bananas were effectively used in the treatment of various diseases, including reducing the risk of many chronic degenerative disorders. But there's more. Banana products and phytoconstituents show enormous potential for future development of drugs for cancer prevention and therapy. And again, there are literally thousands of studies showing the benefits of bananas. Now you may be wondering, why would Gundry lie to us? What's going on in his head? And what is he getting out of it? I will get to that soon too. Ooh, mangoes. <laughs> Studies reveal various mechanisms through which mangoes or their associated compounds reduce risk or reverse metabolic and inflammation associated diseases. New insights on the benefits of mango for brain, skin, and intestinal health. Overall, the foundation of research supporting the potential role of mangoes in reducing risk for inflammation and metabolically based chronic diseases is growing. And uh, thousands of studies proving how mangoes can be amazing for our health. Now, uh, 
I'll be honest with you. This is getting a bit redundant, isn't it? Apples, of course, apples are amazing for our bodies. And yes, of course you can eat tomatoes. Come on. Yeah, sorry, man. Snickers and Hershey's candy bars are not the same as fruits. So what's the missing link here? What's the missing piece of the puzzle that Gundry is hiding? How can those fruits with so much sugar be good for us. Because the amount of sugar in a mango is indeed the same as the amount of sugar in a Hershey's candy bar. Ah, you remember what Dr. Hubel warned us against? Look out for those men who stay on the surface and refuse to show us the deeper truth of what they're talking about. Gundry cherry-picked one data point, sugar. He chose to omit all the other beneficial compounds inside of fruits. And then he used the same single data point, sugar, to make his claim that eating a Hershey's candy bar is the same thing as eating an apple. Come on, man. Toxic heavy metals have been found in Hershey's chocolate. In fact, these corporate ass are facing a lawsuit for it. Shame on you, Gundry, for recommending this toxic shit to our children, you schmuck. And last time I checked, there aren't any toxic heavy metals in fruits. Hey bro, you found any toxic heavy metals in your mangoes lately? I sure haven't. And uh, about the amazing fiber inside the fruit? Gundry completely forgot about this on purpose. The fiber inside fruit helps ease constipation, improve gut health, and regulate blood sugar levels. So you don't get any crazy insulin spikes. And for sure you would get those from the Hershey's. Cause uh, Hershey's candy doesn't have fiber. Fiber from fruit is amazing because it's fermented by our gut bacteria and produces beneficial microbial metabolites, such as short chain fatty acids, which reduce inflammation. The decreasing dietary fiber intake over the centuries has fostered a gut microbiota detrimental to human health, leading to a global epidemic of diabetes, cancers, and other non-communicable diseases. And uh, as you may have guessed, fiber is linked to a lower risk of death and chronic diseases. So uh, I think it's uh, settled now. Fruit is totally fine. In fact, fruit is f***ing great for us. And blood sugar is not an issue because it's regulated by the fiber inside the fruit. So uh, what's left to discuss? Hmm, let's make some love to lectins. The lectin monster has been out to get Gundry for decades. Every book Gundry writes, lectins, lectins, lectins. So uh, what's the truth about lectins? Well, first of all, the concentration of lectins in most foods is far too low to pose a threat to healthy individuals. And soaking and cooking will destroy the lectin in foods with a high lectin content. But uh, why are lectins demonized in the first place? Turns out there's a famous story from back in the day when some moron served uncooked kidney beans in a hospital cafeteria and it made the registrar and a few other staff vomit and have diarrhea. Well, duh. This happens due to agglutination, the clumping of red blood cells. And uh, these people were totally fine after a few hours. But marketers can use this information to create fear and then use that fear to sell their shit. And Gundry, dude, you can't just say lectins. There are over 500 types of lectins. Remember what Dr. Hubel told us about sneaky salesmen? They uh, generalize everything. And Gundry over here is running around screaming lectin. We have actual scientists proving that certain lectins can inhibit cancer cells through autophagy and apoptosis. Yes, lectins can help us fight cancer by improving our immune system. For example, the lectin 
from the bark of the mulberry tree activates resting T lymphocytes and induces cell death of activated T cells. Lectins also have antiviral properties and are potential candidates to prevent viral infections. Dude, they can prevent HIV by preventing viral entry into cells. And this article from Harvard clearly shows that lectin-containing foods are associated with lower rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and these foods such as whole grains, nuts, and legumes also help with weight loss. In the Harvard article, they even make fun of people who are writing fad diet books about how dangerous lectins are. Hungry. And sure, there are certain lectins that a very small percentage of the population is allergic to. Some people lack the enzymes to digest lectins. For example, gluten, hevine, certain chitinases, and I'm sure you know people who have allergies to the peanut lectin. Lectins can permeate across the gut wall, which is known as leaky gut. They can get through those pores of the cells lining the intestinal mucosa, and they can deposit themselves in distal organs. Not good. Lectins can also prevent nutrient digestion and absorption in the gut. They can inactivate white blood cells and promote inflammation. People with celiac disease should avoid gluten, which is is indeed a lectin, but that's less than 1% of the population, man. Regular cooked beans, you have not destroyed the lectins. That's well proven. Oh, really? I don't think so. Standard soaking and cooking, which has been done for over 8,000 years, inactivates lectins and completely destroys the lectin activity. And uh, fermentation can destroy 95 to 98% of lectins. Damn. Womp, womp, womp. Another smack to the Gundry goober. I have patients who have been smoking for 45 years and they're living a healthy life and they say, it's because I smoke. And obviously we laugh about it because we all agree that it's not true. So why did this one case move you so? Actually, let me uh, stop you right there. Probably it's because he smoked that he's doing so well. Okay. Wow. Here we have a typical case of a rookie mistake. Dr. Mike talks about a patient who smokes and is overall healthy and Gundry picks up the correlation and magically makes it a causation. You see, just because A correlates with B, it doesn't mean that A causes B. Here are a few examples. Ice cream consumption correlates with murder. So uh, I guess eating ice cream makes people kill each other, right? And uh, living in a poor country correlates with size. So I guess poor people have bigger penises. Time for me to move to Sudan. But let's at least see how Gundry shows proof of his claims. What makes them have longevity is the men, 95% of the men smoke and only 25% of the women don't. What's unique is, as we all know, women live about seven years longer than men. The men in Sardinia have seven year longer lifespan than the women because they're smokers. Ah, anecdotal evidence. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but Dr. Hubel told me about this long ago. Watch out for those people who try to trick you into thinking that correlation equals causation. And those that cherry pick and use anecdotal evidence to back up their claims. But Gundry knows this. He knows that he can trick the untrained, unscientific mind that is incapable of analytical thinking. Hold on a minute though. Gundry gotta have some proof, right? It can't just be anecdotal evidence from his patients and correlation data. I mean, bro, do you even publish? With supplements, which I published at the American Heart Association, then you neglect gate those effects of niacin. Well, I looked up your publications, Dr. Gundry. I couldn't find anything published at AHA. Um, I saw that you had sure. one abstract yeah. that was at, presented at the conference, but it was never a published paper, peer-reviewed. 
Yeah, give it to them, fight the power. Now let's have even more fun and look at the abstract that Gundry submitted to the AHA, American Heart Association. <laughs> Bro, the AHA have put Gundry's abstract, it's not even a study by the way, like there's no real data. They've put it under retraction watch. Retractions are when papers are pulled back because of how shitty they are. Usually it's because of some falsified or cherry picked data, wrong statistical analyses, etc. I've known about this retraction process since my PhD. One of my colleagues, Jan, used to look at the site every single single morning and feel happiness from seeing other researchers' studies retracted from journals. It was literally the happiest I ever saw him. And uh, it makes sense. The dude's German, schadenfreude. And uh, what did the AHA have to say about Gundry's abstract? There are several typographical errors. There is no data in the abstract regarding myocardial T cells infiltration and no statistical analysis for significance provided. And the author is not clear that only anecdotal evidence is used. The abstract in its current version may not be reliable. Even Forbes published an article making fun of Gundry. The Forbes article goes into detail in this Gundry conspiracy. Others have written about it too. But uh, here we are. Gundry is spending millions on advertising and he's reaching the world, taking advantage and uh, shoving supplements down people's throats. Making a sh ton of money by scaring people using made up stories which have no scientific backing. And then you have guys like Dr. Mike who debate Gundry. And uh, before I tell you why Gundry does what he does, I have a message for Dr. Mike. Cause bro, I feel sorry for you. I can see the pain in your eyes and how completely useless and helpless you were during this debate. Let me read you a passage from Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. What's all this love of arguing? No one ever convinces anyone else. Yes, true, said Levin. It most often happens that you argue hotly only because you can't understand what precisely your opponent wants to prove. Levin had often noticed in arguments between the most intelligent people that after enormous efforts and enormous number of logical subtleties and words, the arguers would finally come to the awareness that what they had spent so long struggling to prove to each other had been known to them long, long before from the beginning of the argument, but that they loved different things and therefore did not want to name what they loved so as not to be challenged. He had often felt that sometimes during an argument, you would understand what your opponent loves and suddenly come to love the same thing yourself and agree all at once. And then all reasonings would fall away as superfluous. And sometimes it was the other way around. You would finally say what you yourself love for the sake of which you are inventing your reasonings. And if you happen to say it well and sincerely, the opponent would suddenly agree and stop arguing. That was the very thing he wanted to say. She wrinkled her forehead trying to understand. But as soon as he began to explain, she understood. I understand. You must find out what he's arguing for, what he loves, and then you can. She had fully divined and expressed his poorly expressed thought. Anna Karenina, part four, chapter 13, pages 936 to 937. Dr. Mike, you love medicine. You love knowledge. You love science and getting the truth out to your patients. You love truth, but Gundry doesn't. He's a marketer, a salesman. He loves power, wealth, impact, but not the truth. And you know why? The question is, do I have a God complex? Dr. Kessler says yes. Which makes me wonder if this lawyer has any idea as to the kind of grades one has to receive in college to be accepted at a top medical school. If you have the vaguest clue as to how talented someone has to be to lead a surgical team, 
I have an MD from Harvard. I am board certified in cardiothoracic medicine and trauma surgery. I have been awarded citations from seven different medical boards in New England, and I am never, ever sick at sea. So I ask you, when someone goes into that chapel and they fall on their knees and they pray to God that their wife doesn't miscarry, or that their daughter doesn't bleed to death, or that their mother doesn't suffer acute neural trauma from post-operative shock, who do you think they're praying to? Now, you go ahead and read your Bible, Dennis, and you go to your church, and with any luck, you might win the annual raffle, but if you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two on November 17th, and he doesn't like to be second-guessed. You ask me if I have a God complex? Let me tell you something. I am God. Let's see. They both graduated from Ivy League universities. They're both cardiothoracic surgeons. Huh. And no one knew that Alec Baldwin was playing Dr. Stephen Gundry in this movie. Just amazing. So now you understand? Gundry has no education or expertise in nutrition or gut health, but he can still teach people how to eat and how to cure their leaky gut. So uh, when he said he's not a prophet, I am God. He was right. Dr. Gundry is God. And we know very well that so many doctors have the inner God complex. And no wonder. Patients are helpless victims begging for mercy. You see how desperate people are to lose weight, relieve pain, and treat their chronic diseases? You're probably one of them. And you too may be looking for a God to come to your rescue. But you know, it ain't Gundry. So who is it?